Hello everyone and welcome to my video aimed at introducing you to the wonderful world of radiation protection. My name is Jess Heaps and I'm a health physicist working for Rolls-Royce submarines in Derby. So I understand most of you will be A-level physics students or perhaps you're studying another um, related STEM subject. Um, and you're watching this because you're attending the University of Liverpool online nuclear physics masterclass. If not, perhaps you're just interested in careers in radiation protection or you fancy finding out more about this area. Either way, welcome. It is great to have you. So I've been asked to prepare this video as a University of Liverpool uh, graduate. Um, now nuclear industry professional to show you how some of your A-level um, physics topics are put to use in the world of work and to highlight career pathways open to you in industry, specifically radiation protection as that's my area of expertise. So I anticipate this talk will take around about 15 minutes so let's get started. Okay, so um, a little bit about me. Like I said earlier, my name is Jess Heaps, although um, I um, have gotten married since I left university. So my surname was Revel when I was studying and I graduated from the University of Liverpool in 2015 with a degree in physics with nuclear science. Since then, since I left, um, so for the past five years or so, I have been working as a health physicist in the field of radiation protection for Rolls-Royce submarines in Derby. So what is radiation protection? Um, it's pretty much what it says on the tin, actually. So it's the um, profession of protecting people and the environment from the harmful effects of radiation. Now by harmful effects, I can mean things like um, an increased risk of cancer. Um, and by people, um, we can mean either the workforce um, for a particular company or site or the general public who um, live near that site. And radiation can um, mean either ionizing or non-ionizing radiation. And you'll see from the diagram at the bottom of the slide that there's a couple of different types of ionizing and non-ionizing radiation. So non-ionizing radiation includes things like um, lasers, microwaves, radio waves, etc. And ionizing radiation is um, could be X-rays, gamma rays, um, and cosmic rays, things like that. I've added cosmic rays to the end because it's not on the diagram. But they're just a couple of examples. OK, so my current role, um, so it's my job to protect the Rolls-Royce workforce from the harmful effects of ionising radiation because Rolls-Royce as an employer, they, they carry out work with um, radioactive material that emits ionising radiation. And you might be surprised to hear that Rolls-Royce don't just make jet engines or cars. Um, they do actually design and manufacture nuclear reactors which power the UK Royal Navy submarines. Uh, and that involves manipulating highly enriched uranium. And there's a picture of some highly enriched uranium in the top right hand corner of the screen there. My job is really, really varied. Um, a couple of examples of the kind of things that I do is um, I provide a lot of radiation protection training to the workforce. So enabling the workforce to keep themselves and others safe, um, help dispose of radioactive waste, I monitor for radiation and contamination, and I ensure that Rolls-Royce is operating compliantly according to the law. So the book that you can see pictured on the screen there is um, it's our radiation protection Bible, basically. Um, it's the Ionizing Radiations Regulations, or the IRRs, and these have been written by the Health and Safety Executive, and any employer that carries out work with ionising radiation has to adhere to those regulations. So that is the law. So one of the things that I do is I make sure that Rolls-Royce is operating according to the law. 
So how did I get to where I am today? Um, you might be surprised to hear that I wasn't actually a fan of science at school. I thought it was pretty boring. Um, I definitely discovered my love for science a bit later on in life. So um, I did A levels in chemistry, physics and maths um, because I wanted to join the Royal Navy when I was 18. You can join at 16. Um, so I needed something to bridge that two year gap and I thought, well, I might as well do A-levels and I didn't know what subjects to pick. So I asked my mum and dad and they said, oh, why don't you do science and maths? And I was like, OK, <laughs> um, it's a good thing I did, though, because I ended up falling back on those a couple of years later. So I did do a brief stint in the Royal Navy when I was 18. And there's a picture of me there in my uniform. Um, it wasn't the life for me, so um, you know, I left and I worked in the pharmaceutical industry for a couple of years as an analytical chemist. There's a couple of pictures from me back then as well. So when I was working in the pharmaceutical industry, I kind of realised, you know, I really need to get some further education if I want to um, progress anymore, because I kind of hit a bit of a bit of a ceiling and um you know, I couldn't progress any further. So um, by this point, I had discovered my love for science, particularly physics. So I went to the University of Liverpool to study physics with nuclear science. And um, whilst I was at university, I did two sort of summer placements or summer jobs like um, during my summers at uni. The first one was a summer placement with Canberra who are now called um, Mirian Technologies. Um, at the time, they had quite a, a close relationship with Liverpool Uni and provided a lot of their um, lab equipment. I don't know if they still do. And my second summer at uni, I had a job with um, AMEC, who have changed names many times since then. At the moment, they're called Jacobs. And I worked for them as a trainee health physicist. And um, also, whilst I was at university, I met Pete Cole, who is one of the professors at Liverpool University, and he's also head of their radiation protection. Um, and at the time, he was president of the Society for Radiological Protection, which I'll tell you a little bit more about um, a bit later. But it was Pete who really sparked my interest in, in radiation protection. So um, I decided to join the society as a student member. Um, and I did actually find my current job at Rolls-Royce um, via the SRP newsletter. So I applied and I was, I was successful, um, which I was really happy about. So I graduated from uni and joined Rolls-Royce as a health physicist um, a couple of weeks after my last exam. Um, and I, absolutely love my job now. Um, I would definitely recommend a career in radiation protection, but I'll tell you a little bit more about um, what career options are available to you a little bit later on. And that picture there is me with some of my Rolls-Royce colleagues. Not That's not the whole um, radiation protection team. That's just a select few who are SRP members. OK, so now I'd like to discuss one particular A-level curriculum concept, which has real life applications in the working world of radiation protection. So this is stuff that I use all the time. Um, I want to talk about time distance shielding. And this might be a phrase that you've heard before. And it refers to the protection methods that we use um, for external radiation hazards. So what I mean by an external radiation hazard is where the radioactive source is outside the body. Um, it's um, a hazard that you can walk away from. So for example, a dental x-ray or, you know, if you were to stand next to an operating nuclear reactor. The other type of hazard is internal um, and this is where radioactive material known as contamination gets inside the body. And there's kind of four pathways that it can get inside the body. There's inhalation, ingestion, um, 
you know, through an open wound, um, we call that injection, or absorption through the skin. So an example of this would be, uh, of an internal exposure would be um, breathing in fallout from a nuclear weapons test or um, a disaster such as Fukushima. So, you know, when the radioactive material is inside your body, you can't walk away from the hazard anymore because it is inside you. And as you can see from that diagram, different radionuclides have affinities for different um, organs and tissue. So, for example, iodine-131 has an affinity to your thyroid, so that's where it will collect. In fact, the predominant hazard on my site where I work is um, internal because we have highly enriched uranium contamination. But the protection methods for internal hazards are slightly different. Um, so I'm not going to discuss these any further here. Um, time, distance and shielding will only protect you from external hazards. So that's what we're going to talk about. So time, distance and shielding is um, a list of control measures in order of preference. So for time, the idea is that you limit the amount of time spent in the vicinity of the source. I'm going to expand on these concepts a bit more in, in a second. Distance, maximise the distance between yourself and the source. And finally, as a last resort, you should attenuate or reduce um, the radiation dose rates using shielding. So just to expand on those um, concepts a bit more. So time, the first concept, you can work out how much of a dose um, somebody is going to receive by multiplying the dose rate times the exposure time. So for example, if you had a source generating a dose rate of 10 millisieverts an hour, in one hour you'd receive 10 millisieverts. If you reduce the exposure time to just six minutes, then um, you'd only get a dose of 0.1 millisievert. So that's 100 times lower. So minimize the time spent in the vicinity of the source, you minimize your dose. So um, going back to dental x-rays, think about how long a dental x-ray lasts. You know, um, I'm hoping that, that most people watching this will have um, experienced a dental x-ray and you think, oh, it's, it's in the blink of an eye, isn't it? It's like milliseconds. Um, and you will also have noticed that your dentist will leave the room. Um, I don't want you to worry about this. That's that's more to protect them, because if you think you might have a dental x-ray once every couple of months or years, but the dentists and, um, you know, the dental staff, they will potentially perform many, many x-rays per day. Um, and so they have to limit their time spent near the x-ray source. Okay, so the second concept is distance. So the radiation dose rate will decrease with distance according to what we call the inverse square law. Basically, if you double your distance, you will quarter the dose rate. Um, and you can, you know, stand further away from the source and use telescopic tools. So you can use things like CV reachers, which is pitched on the left, um, and tongs. And that means that you can manipulate sources at a distance. You can also use telescopic radiation detectors pictured on the right, which means that you can measure radiation dose rates um, at a distance as well. Again, thinking about the dental x-ray, um, the, the dentist will um, probably leave the room or go and stand further away whilst the x-ray is on. Um, and that's to maximise the distance between them and the x-ray source. Finally, shielding. So shielding can be built in, for example, um, shield walls in an x-ray booth or a radiography booth, or they can be temporary, um, such as lead or concrete blocks, which is pictured left, or you can actually um, wear it on, on your person as personal protective equipment, PPE, for example, a lead apron, which is pictured on the right. Different shielding is used for different types of radiation. 
um, and it's important that you do use the right kind of shielding. So for example, lead is very good for shielding against gamma, but not um, beta particles because that will actually generate additional secondary radiation called bremsstrahling. So you have to be careful. So that was a very brief explanation of time, distance and shielding, but hopefully I've explained it in a way that makes sense and enables you to see the things, um, enables you to see how the things that you're learning about now are genuinely really useful in real life. Okay, so I did promise that I would talk to you a little bit more about careers in radiation protection. So there's lots of different um, sectors that you can go into. So there's medicine, um, nuclear power, defense, which is the sector that I'm in, um, academia, nuclear waste management and decommissioning, environmental protection and government regulation. So government regulation is um, where you enforce the law. So you enforce those ionizing radiations regulations and you get to go and inspect sites and tell people what to do um, and what they're doing wrong. Um, so there are lots of different sectors. It, it's a very broad profession. But why should you consider a career in radiation protection? Um, this is just my opinion, but I think a lot of my colleagues would agree with me. I think radiation protection is really good fun and it's really varied. You know, it's really intellectually stimulating. You never stop learning. There is so much to learn. Um, I'm never bored ever. Um, it's really rewarding because you are helping to protect people at the end of the day. Um, there's lots of opportunities to progress. So you can become a certified radiation protection advisor. Um, I've just submitted my portfolio for this. So I'm really hoping by the time you guys watch this, I will um, have been successful and I'll have my certificate in the post. Please wish me luck. Um, you can also specialise in radioactive waste and become a radioactive waste advisor. Um, there's other titles that you can earn as well. It's not just limited to those two. In general, as a profession, radiation protection is well paid because it's very, very niche. And you'll always be in demand because it is so niche and there's so few people doing it. So you'll have very good job security as well. So I hope I'm selling this to you. How do you get into radiation protection? So you don't necessarily need a degree. Um, you can join at what's called a health physics monitor or health physics technician level. Um, and these are people who tend to do a lot of like contract work or um, they do a lot of like routine operational stuff. And um, some people join um, like apprenticeships. But um, for you guys who are planning on doing degrees, you'll probably enter at, you know, a health physicist level. Um, health physicists, RPAs, RWAs, etc. do tend to have scientific degrees. Um, and these are usually physics related, but not always. Um, sometimes it's just a STEM subject. So you can join a graduate scheme, um, for example, nuclear graduates, or you can go through a company specific graduate scheme um, such as the one that Sellafield run or um, you can just apply for a direct entry role um, which is what I did I just applied for a health physicist position at Rolls-Royce and that was advertised through the SRP so I didn't go on a graduate scheme I just joined directly so um, whilst I'm here you've, you've heard me mention the SRP a couple of times and I just wanted to explain who they are and um, why they're relevant and why this is helpful. Um, I don't get commission for any of this, by the way. I am a member of the Society for Radiological Protection, um, but I don't I don't get money for promoting them or anything. I just genuinely love, you know, being a part of that community and promoting what they do. So, SRP are a professional society with around two thousand members, most of them in the UK, and their objective is to promote the science and art of radiation protection. So they, um, what do they do? They communicate knowledge um, and promote education. So they do a lot of public outreach with um, both the general public and schools, etc. They set standards for radiation protection professionals. Um, 
so that people who employ us know that we are all operating to the same kind of code of conduct. They work closely with similar societies such as the International Radiation Protection Association, um, etc. And they promote inclusion and diversity. So, um, for example, they've done quite a bit of work trying to get more girls to do physics, things like that. How can SRP help you? Um, they actually offer free membership for students. Um, it's called affiliate membership, but um, that does encompass students and it is free. So you might as well, um, like I say, I found my current job through SRP and I actually credit SRP with a lot of my um, professional success so far, just because of the opportunities that they've provided for me. So part of the SRP strategic plan is to provide support to um, young radiation protection professionals. They've even got their own um, subgroup called the Rising Generations Group, which is aimed at um, radiation protection professionals in the first 10 years of their career. It's basically like a student union or a club for um, sort of usually younger radiation protection professionals. It's, it's great fun. Um, and you get to like socialize with, um, you know, people who are like-minded. SRP runs a Young Professionals Award every couple of years where you can um, enter a work-related um, presentation and win prizes. They've got careers advice, job adverts, like I say, they run a mentoring scheme where they match you with somebody senior in a, in a similar role to you and you can get coaching and advice from them. Um, and they can help arrange with placements as well. So if you're interested in finding out more, just go to the SRP website, which is srp-uk.org. OK, so I have gone over um, 15 minutes. It's, it's more like 20. So sorry about that, everybody. But I just wanted to say thank you so much for listening. Um, so today I've just talked about radiation protection, who I am, um, how I got to where I am now, um, what career options are available to you, how to get there. And I've also plugged SRP a little bit as well. So um, the link to the SRP website is um, posted on the screen now if you do want to find out more. Um, and you can also search for SRP on social media as well. So um, I won't go on any longer. Um, if you have any further questions, um, I'm assuming your teachers or lecturers can, can send me a, a list of those and I can address those individually. But um, yeah, thank you very much.